working in conjunction here with, with Daryl and team to produce some of these labs and whatnot. Um, and this particular one's going to be about logic analyzers. So uh, my name is Jonathan Steins. I'm a pen tester on the Rapid7 team. Uh, and just to dive right in, wh what is the purpose of a logic analyzer? So in essence, um, developers use logic analyzers pretty heavily for doing things such as you know, debugging um, protocols. So if they're doing something like what we see in the picture here that has probably some form of inner chip communication, maybe there's like SPI or I2C, logic analyzers enable you to dig down and see underneath the hood what's actually going on. Works fantastically for troubleshooting. Um, just think like Wireshark for hardware analysis. Um, like I was mentioning, it could also be used to debug. So it's used to troubleshoot maybe some, why, why is my software not working? Why is, you know, this embedded firmware not talking from the, you know, SPI flash chip to my MCU? Uh, Logic Analyzer can kind of help troubleshoot that. So that's the sort of developer -y perspective of using a Logic Analyzer. Now, wh how would we use them in IoT? So of course, you know, we have uh, the pizza delivery uh, pizza and doom guy and then the old hacker with the uh, ski mask underneath. Um, we use them in IoT is uh, our goal is to dump the firmware. So, you know, once the firmware is dumped, um, it's oftentimes mostly dumped through serial interfaces, unless we're doing something like removing a chip. So whenever we're talking about this, it's going to be more so focused on from the perspective of like doing something like dumping firmware from some type of interface whether that be UART, whether that be like SPI, whether that be I2C. Um, also, it's to interact with the, with the device. I know that we, if you've attended any of our other talks um, uh, from, from today with regard to U-Boot or any of the talks yesterday, um, we've talked a lot about UART. So UART will be the serial, um, I guess, mechanism that we would use to interact with some of these devices. So what we want to do is uh, identify what is the pinout of some of these devices. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on in the slides here. But a lot of the times the, uh, the pins, they're not labeled. So we need to figure out, OK, A, what is uh, type of protocol is being used for these pins? And B, which individual channel is being sent or what kind of data is being transported over those pins? So uh, things such as uh, uh, you can check things on a simple serial bus, such as like SPI, I2S, I2C, UART, things like that using the logic analyzer. Uh, what are the types of logic analyzers? Again, I know we're kind of talking about maybe some boring stuff, but uh, just to kind of take you a little bit back in, back in time here. The bottom left corner is a desktop logic analyzer. You don't really see those that much these days. That looks more like an oscilloscope, but uh, it's in fact a logic analyzer. If you kind of take a closer look, you can see that it's actually measuring digital frequencies, something that an oscilloscope does not do, which we'll talk about more later. Uh, what, we'll, we'll, what we will be talking about and looking at in our demos is going to be USB logic analyzers. And those look more like the things you see on the right side of the screen. So the Sailey is like one of the more popular ones. And you have a couple of the others like Travel Logic in this particular case. Um, the USB analyzers tend to be cheap and they tend to be small. Desktop analyzers tend to be large and they tend to be expensive. We'll talk also a little bit about oscilloscopes later, um, but the, uh, lar the logic analyzer has a small amount of memory, but a large number of channels. That's pretty important because we'll kind of compare and contrast what, may what might be right for you. If you're wanting to get started with some of this stuff, what would be best for you with what you're doing with whatever it is that your, your goal is. Um, logic Analyzer is a visual representation of the data that it processes as well. So when, when I say that it's a visual representation, it's making the calculation and representing what it thinks is what that data looks like rather than oscilloscope, which is the actual analog signals that's traversing over the voltage the, with, with the voltages of the chip. Um, these uh, logic analyzers, we'll talk about price later, but uh, like I was mentioning earlier, USB logic, analy logic analyzers tend to be very cheap. Okay, a logic analyzer is not an oscilloscope. So uh, all these snippets I stole off the, uh, the Saley website. Um, the oscilloscope, it measures, the, the idea in general is that it's measuring constantly. It's, it's not like, um, like a This is quite possibly the most boring slide I've had. So, so 
sucks to be all. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, they're all equally bad. Uh, so anyways, oscilloscope is not a logic game. That oscilloscope measures analog, whereas uh, logic analyzers measure digital. And I'm actually glad that we went back to this one because some logic analyzers can actually measure analog. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I'll kind of show you. We'll go over a few different logic analyzers um, just to kind of see what. Uh, um, but I, I probably should just use like a blanket statement and say that uh, logic, analyzer, logic analyzers cannot measure analog because that's not a true statement. They can to a certain extent, but many of them do not. So as I was mentioning, um, they are not used for any type of like UART connection. So you data being transmitted over UART, but you can't actually set up like, okay, hey, I want to toss in like a, you know, let's uh, let's connect to this using eight bit, you know, parity, and then we'll of course do like the bug rate of like eleven five two hundred and then interact with this like device. That's not what you can do with the logic analyzer. Logic analyzer is more of just a passive listen. It's something like Wireshark or hardware. Um, it's uh, not uh, an oscilloscope. So um, from an oscilloscope perspective, basically you're looking at, at, at voltages over a period of time. So it uses memory. So it's using, you know, say for For OCD. Uh, so we have the Saley, right? And so the Saley is, I don't want to say the de facto, but it kind of is de facto. Um, it's, it's a little also some software and a pretty large online community um, and support that is available that is that goes hand in hand with this particular logic analyzer. There are other uh, logic analyzers, of course, that exist, and we'll look a little bit more about the prices. What did we pay for these? Between like five and fifteen, twenty bucks. I think it was two. like uh, twelve for one and twenty-four for the other one. Very cheap, you know. Like go sell like a, a garbage bag full of you know uh, aluminum cans and then buy like the stuff here because it, you can just. It, it, it's just outrageously cheap. So, anyways, we'll do some pros and cons between all these guys, but we're going to kind of just give like a, let's just go ahead and hook something up with it. Um, what we're actually going to look at with it is going to be Raspberry Pi. Um, what we're going to look at also with it is Raspberry Pi has a um, UART interface. I'm sure as many of you guys know. Um, and I'm going to try to just take the examples just to kind of give you an idea. Um, but here is the Raspberry Pi, like, sort of pan out. And hopefully everyone can see that. Now, Daryl, is this showing up on the screen? Yes. The, okay, perfect. So whenever you're looking at it, uh, it's just basically how, how, it's the, how it's laid out. So um, let's just be aware that it. Okay, how's, how's that look? That looks good. 
Cool. So, uh, as you can see in the uh, on the screen, um, we have ground several grounds, and then uh, right here on these two, uh, we have RX and TX. Uh, so RX and TX are the two interfaces that we're going to target for UART. So if we count down one, two, three, four is RX or TX rather, and then one, two, three, four, five is is uh, RX. So, and then we'll have a ground down here in the bottom left hand corner. So let's get this sucker hooked up. Uh, I'm gonna, I wanna start this off with you guys uh, with the, uh, just, I guess just the matter in this particular case, but whenever you're looking at the actual like logic analyzer, you can see that there's like a mapping of the pins on it as well. So it's basically like channel zero through seven. And then there's two grounds, and what that's based off of is the actual like layout of the pins on this thing, and then you have the actual pins. So what we'll do is we'll take these uh we have these three jumper wires here, and we're gonna actually get rid of the old Raspberry Pi pin out crap. We're actually just kind of move it over that way, and then uh we're going to. Just kind of hook these suckers up, you know what I mean? So we'll take ground. We're just going to use black. We'll try to be uh, correct with our color usage here. Black for ground. So we'll hook that up to one of the two grounds there. And we'll hook up white to channel zero. And we'll hook up this like silver color to channel one. And if you guys think this is fun watching me do this, just wait till we get the SPI. So, uh, that's exciting to look forward to. And then, uh, as we saw earlier with the pin out, uh, ground is the bottom left hand quarter one here. Uh, remember, we hooked up white we're gonna, uh, to channel zero. We're going to hook white up to channel. It's the fourth pin, so we'll use the TX here. And we'll hook up this little silver to, uh, to RX. And that's it. So, that is pretty much how these hook up. Um, and we'll look at several other devices, but I just wanted to give a, just to give everyone an idea so we're not kind of you know functioning uh, in the dark here. So let's put a pin in this and let's circle back to some of the slides here. So we now uh, know what that looks like. Now I've done a lot of talking here. Do we have yeah, any I think we have questions? a couple of questions here. Uh, let me look. There was one question. And you may have already covered it, but I want to make sure it's asked. It's in the channel. Are there any equipment models that you can do uh, experience to come across any uh, models of devices like that? Yeah, so uh, some do have the capability of doing both analog and digital. Um, most of the cheaper ones are only digital. Um, now, the ones that support analog and digital are typically a little bit more expensive. And a great example of that is the Saley. It, it supports both M8 channel. Um, but uh, yeah, so some models do support it. Typically, you'll be paying a little bit more money for it. So I would definitely ask yourself, um, is analog something I truly need for the type of uh, debugging, the type of troubleshooting, the type of development, or the type of hacking that I'll be doing? Uh, one other question day? here. Um, so uh, where would where can somebody buy the the cheaper logic analyzers that you're uh, demoing here and uh would they work uh for he's newer to iot versus having a larger investment that is a very well timed question because let me uh let me kind of slot this slide up here um, this is uh, a couple of examples of where you can get some of these uh, logic analyzers. The, on the, on the, the left side of the screen, I pulled this directly from the Staley website. Again, these are the nicer models that support both analog and digital. I'll also show everyone here on the call what it looks like and what it means to actually have a nicer one versus a not so nice one. So. Are you going to be spending, in this case, an example to have on the screen, uh, 13 to $24? Or you can have a peek at that. But uh, the left side of the screen here, uh, the pricing is from Saley. You can buy them on Amazon. You can, you can buy them on eBay. You can buy them on 
you can buy them on Spark Fun. Uh, the price on the right, for the two cheap ones below and above the dude uh, whose wallet is on fire, were uh, off Amazon. I had just screenshotted that maybe like three or four days ago. Um, as far as the features between differences in between the cheaper one versus the more expensive one in your dance, we'll take a peek at that uh, in a couple of demos, a uh, few slides Great. down the road. Uh, no more questions. I guess you can move on. Sweet. So moving on here, we, uh, as I talked about earlier, the signaling. Um, Analog signaling is just a continuous changing values, whereas digital's defined values based on a range of voltage that we're going to see with these USB logic logic analyzers. Um, bear in mind, it's not a hundred percent accurate. So if you're like needing to be like pinpoint accuracy on voltages, the logic analyzer is going to be accurate. I also wanted to share with you what those digital versus analog signals look like. So whenever we dive into the software here pretty soon, we can kind of see what those waveforms are and how they differ from one another. The uh, voltage above a certain threshold is, uh, and digital signaling with logic analyzers is binary. If it's, if it's going low, then that's considered a zero. If it's going high, it's considered a one. And those that determination is based upon that particular threshold. Transistor, the technology um, is basically using. Uh, logic analyzer will sample the, the voltages at various intervals and reconstruct what that table looks like. So just want to kind of just uh, shine a little bit of context as to analog versus digital. Uh, so, um, there's two main types that I've used in my experience. Your mileage may vary. Um, I know there's a lot of different other uh, like uh, software, I guess, vendors, makers out there. I'm, I'm Mac based, so I'm kind of handcuffed to Mac, fortunately, because that would, would kind of totally also um, capable of running a Linux too. So the top left corner is Sigrock's Pulse View. So Sigrock is a, a manufacturer of logic analyzer as well as the software. And Pulse is the actual software name. Now, the what we're going to talk actually has Sigrock Cli, and I'll be honest with you, um, I love I love the, the fact that they're open source. I love the fact that it's free. They're actually both the software here is free, but the Pulse View, the graphical interface, is just not the greatest. Like it's got it's more robust, I guess you could say. So. Unfortunately, we're not going to go over it today because it would probably take up a little bit too much time. But uh, to kind of dive in here, uh, what I wanted to do was just kind of compare these two software sets with you. So uh, with that being said, let's just dive right in. You know, let's just let's just take a look here. Screw it. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to do first is um, I want to continue to with where we left off with this particular logic analyzer and the more expensive stuff How about that um well uh, we've got a couple wires here we've got a power power for the raspberry pi sitting right here i have a usb power strip here that i'm just going to kind of power off the pi real fast and we'll go ahead and grab the other cable for our logic analyzer that's right there let's go ahead and plug this puppy in yeah um, now, as we're doing this, um, again, this is going to power for the, for the right here for the logic analyzer. And what we're going to do next is let me. Uh -oh. There we go. Okay, cool. Move that here. So I'm going to bring up the software on the other side of the screen here um, for us. And the first one we're going to look at is Pulse View. So I just want to kind of give you just a quick little demo of what some of this looks like. So as you can see here, uh, let me shift that that way. We have everything hooked up on this side of the house. Um, rem remember, we have UART. So RXTX hooked up to this based off the pinout that we found online. And of course, Ground's hooked up as well. We followed the mappings here. So 
Um, we're going to kind of take a white box approach with this and let's just assume that we know everything already. So let's assume that we found the data sheet for the, the device that we want to kind of probe and take a look at. Um, what we want to do next is uh, from the software here, I'll give you a quick little run through. So we'll go back to, uh, to full screen. Uh, this, this is the, the SIGROT Pulse view. So with the Pulse view, you can select the device that you have plugged into your computer. And this particular one, the driver that we need is the FX2 LAFW. So we'll select that from the dropdown and we'll click scan for devices using the driver above. And then we'll click OK. And that basically has it hooked up. So what happens here is an airplane fly, fly, flying above here. So I'll be able to hear some uh, background to that. What you see here is that uh, there is uh, eight channels starting at zero and ending at seven. So that's representing the uh, eight channels that the logic analyzer has. Remember, it's zero through seven on the on the logic analyzer. Uh, what we can do is we can lower that because we're only using RX and TX. Ground is assumed. You're always going to use ground. So we want to select D0 and D D1. So we're going to remove some of these other guys here. Uh, going back to the software here, um, you can change the amount of sampling that it does. In this particular case, I have it set at one millisamples milli per second. So uh, that's uh, the setting for that. And the, we'll talk about that a little bit more whenever we get into Sali software. But the cheaper logic analyzers can sample at a slower rate than the Sali. So um, there's a little bit of a limitation here. And here's the speeds as well. So we're going to stick 20 kilohertz. Uh, so let's just, you know, let's just plug the sucker in. Let's just see what happens, right? So uh, I'm going to hit the power button. We're going to see the lights come on on the Raspberry Pi right here. And then uh, I'm going to hit the run button. Whoopsie daisy. Stop. <laughs> let's try that again. And then we can click this button here, which makes us keep up kind of with the timing of the actual logic analysis that's taking place. So we'll see kind of some, some uh, spikes and voltages as things kind of happen. Again, this is over UART. So think of like the TTY connection over some type of serial or SSH interface. Imagine just the boot up of a Raspberry Pi. So it's just gonna do its crap. And then at the end, it's gonna be like, okay, Raspberry login type stuff. Um, so we'll go ahead and stop it now that we're getting kind of closer towards the, the end here. Uh, yeah, that's that's the last one. So if we take a look here, um, this is basically the capture. I captured for, as you can see, 35 seconds. So the thing about, about this, let's go ahead and go back into full screen. We don't really need the camera so much right now, but uh, we'll go ahead and expand everything back out. And let's just take a look over here because this is the, let's just pretend again, let's just assume that we know the answer to this. This is basically where it's just prompting for a login for the UART interface. So we'll go in here and we'll kind of scroll, scroll, scroll. And even if you were unsure of which one was RX or TX, you could pretty well assume if you at least knew that these two connections were UART, that this one's going to be TX and this one's going to be RX. How is that? Because TX is sending us data and RX is literally a flat line. So a couple of things there that can kind of kind of help you out. Um, and uh, one other thing too is that this particular software does have protocol debuggers. So let's take a look at that. And let's go ahead and remember we uh, we set TX to D0 and we set RX to D1. So uh, another thing too, we already have 115200. We're going to keep everything else basically default here. Last last uh, the least significant bit first uh, is. Uh, Correct. We'll switch that to ASCII and we'll come in here and then it should do some decoding for us. Um, so here, usually it takes a second. Let's see if she works here. Yeah, so again, um, just a high level example of the, the protocol of decoding available for this particular Pulse View software um, and some of the stuff you can do. So it recognizes stop bits, it recognizes frame errors, break conditions, things like that. Now, what I wanna also do um, real quick, we'll, let's just ex exit completely out of here. Uh, we don't wanna save. Another thing too is it's pretty uh, nifty. Uh, Pulse View has a uh, SIGROC. They have like their own proprietary format where you can like save your data and then like import it into Sali or uh, other. It can manipulate it also from the command line. We want to now switch over to uh, the logic software from Saley. So 
Staley has their own set of software. They actually have two sets of software that we're going to review. And I, what I want to do is, uh, let me open it up here. And what I want to do is uh, show both you guys both sets of software um, to kind of show you the epicness of uh, what it has the capability of doing. So. On the left-hand side here, we have uh, the Saley Logic 1.0, 1.2.18 software, I guess technically. Um, and in this particular case, uh, it's very similar. So remember, here's all the eight channels and um, that's pretty much the situation that we're looking at. Mind you, remember, this is all digital signaling. So there's no actual, um, there's no actual uh, analog signals going on in this particular case. So very similar to the other um, software, uh, you can do the same protocol analysis. So we have, for instance, async serial, which is UART. And a, uh, UART is an async serial communication protocol with I2C and SPI. So there's a whole list of different protocols supported also by the Saley software. Um, your decoded protocols, it can actually decode also. Uh, as we saw earlier with the other software, it decoded it, but it's kind of limited on the amount of information that it can present to you. The command line is where the SIGROC uh, software is very strong compared to Saley. Um, there's also annotations. So with the annotations, you can kind of capture during periods of time. But the thing I want to show you guys the most here is with logic analyzers. It's not specific to Saley. But let's uh, let's just go ahead and uh, power this guy off. So as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, the lights now off on the on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, let's go ahead and power it back on. Uh, but also let's yep, we're capturing for thirty seconds. Let's just stick to to four um, mega samples per second, and then we'll go ahead and power this sucker back on and we'll let it start. So as you can see right here, um, the only sad panda part about the uh, Saley software is that it doesn't like live view show like the results of what's going on with everything. So you're kind of like, you're kind of stuck with like uh, just this kind of boring screen here. So you can't really see the sort of interactive like, oh, here's like, you know, the waveforms and whatnot, um, but whatever, it's it's all good. We'll go over some uh, the 2.0 version of it where it does offer some sexier gooey stuff. So here's the output of, of, of our capture. So let's scroll out and we can see very similar to the pulse view, let's take this full screen, um, that there was actually some data captured here, very similar to what we saw earlier. Now let's scroll in. And as we talked about earlier, remember channel zero is the TX line of the Raspberry Pi. So of course we're gonna see data. Now, uh, a couple, couple things is that, let's say we wanna add, um, a protocol debugger, just like what, what we did with the pulse view. Let's go ahead and add this. Uh, we'll say channel zero the serial, that's the TX channel. And let's click auto baud, right? So pr let's pretend for a second that we do not even know the baud rate of this device. Let's pretend that we actually think that it's UR, but we actually don't know if it's TX or RX. We've already actually kind of figured out that it's TX because remember channel zero, we're seeing data. It's transmitting data to us. RX is a flat line because we're not sending any data back. So we do not know the baud rate. Let's just pretend like we want to open up like a screen session or some type of like a serial session with the device over TTY serial, uh, but we do not know the actual bit rate of that serial connection. So we'll just leave that default, default 9600. We'll click this little checkbox here, auto baud. We'll keep everything else default as well. This is all pretty standard for a normal serial interface on an embedded system. We'll click save. We now see the async serial is here in this corner. Uh, and kind of a uh, cool little thing you can do also to help you figure out that baud rate. Um, this is this is pretty neat. Um, now earlier, I'm going to bring this this up for you guys real quick. Uh, in the actual slide presentation, I had this little table here that showed the actual microseconds as well as the baud rate in this table. So if it's 833 microseconds, it's a 1200. Is a, the bit rate is 1200. If it's 52 microseconds, it's 19200. If it's eight microseconds, it's 11,500. Now, if we go back here, what we can actually do is we see the actual, um, let's take a look here, the waveform. So from where the actual uh, rising edge to a falling edge of one complete uniform wave. Here we go, this is a good one. It's super tiny, uh, but I hope you guys can see that. 8.5 microseconds. 
it's pretty nifty because that basically tells us what the baud rate is without us even having to like measure the baud rate. So if we, you know, go back to our table here, remember 8.5, 8.5 is what it measured as the baud rate. And we look here and eight microseconds is 11.5200. Remember digital, it's never gonna be 100% accurate. It's gonna do its best at that representation. Also, there's latency in the cable, there's latency in USB 2.0. In this case, this is one of the cheaper logic analyzers we're using USB 2.0. So either way, it's not going to be 100% accurate. It's going to be like slightly off, but it's safe to assume that's closest to that number than it is to any of these other numbers. So that being said, let's uh, let's just do let's do something a little wacky here and just enjoy the luxury luxurious features of the uh, Saley software. So I just lowered the sample time to five seconds. Uh, remember, uh, if we go back here to the settings, we we have it set. Let's just group see it automatically detect it's already changed but let's just put it back to 9600 imagine this is like a fresh scan well so we'll power the device off and then we'll power the sucker back on and then we'll go ahead and, and start sampling so based off of the sample rate the Saley software is smart enough to realize what that particular baud rate is in this case it already converted to us well that is not the actual bit rate even though that would probably work uh it's 115200 um it's close enough for what we're trying to do here. So uh, let's let's take it a step further and then let's switch this back over to uh, to 30 seconds. And let's power it off and then let's uh, let's power it back on again. Now that we know our baud rate, let's just see what it can do. And let's make it full screen because uh, you all know what a Raspberry Pi looks like. Well, I can't make it full screen. I'm gonna sit here and just stare at this thing boot up. So while we're having a little break, let me ask you one of the questions. So I have a question here. Is the Sale uh, or the PulseView logic analyzer software free and open source? Uh, how would you go about downloading or purchasing those? The Sale software, it is actually free. Um, it is not open source, however. Um, it's it's free. You can download it straight from their, their website. Um, you can't compile it because, again, it's not open source, but uh, it's 100% free. You don't have to spend, spend a dime for it. However, the uh, SIGROC, so the PulseView software, I believe the GUI is open source. 100% I know the SIGROC CLI is open source because I just compiled it actually like two hours ago. Um, but yeah, so the uh, Saley logic free, not open source. SIGROC PulseView, 100% um, free, maybe open source. SIGROC CLI free and open source. And Taking a peek here real quick, um, we can see in the, the decoded protocol section here that we actually have um, the output of what we saw over the UART interface. So under voltage, it's kind of printed funky here, but that's the actual output of what it's seeing. Uh, we had it set to the ASCII. So the output is being displayed in, in ASCII format. So kind of neat, you can see all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, scrolling even further down here, and we have like, you know, detected, blah, 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 but go to the very bottom. Um, maybe we missed it, but uh, it, it would even capture, yep, there we go, like Raspberry Pi login. And that's basically on the UART connection, waiting for the, you know, the typical Pi, you know, password Raspberry, because no one ever changes their default on that. So anyways, um, as for that particular um, demonstration, that that's pretty much it. And, you know, kind of continuing on, with that particular question that was asked regarding the free and open source nature. Are there any other questions, um, I guess, up, up until now? Yeah, I have uh, just one more for you. Uh, what is the max number of logic analyzer channels uh, needed for most IoT situations? That's a good question. Um, and I'll be perfectly honest, like I rarely run into an instance and I, I, I do this you know, I, I, I'm not like hacking on IOT like full time with my day job. And again, I'm a pin tester, but um, I do it a lot um, just kind of as a hobbyist as well as just kind of as a side type thing. There's very rare instances that I've run into a situation where I needed more than eight channels. So in cases that I've ever used these logic analyzers, it's mostly been on three different protocols, UART, SPI, 
and I2C. And none of those three, uh, I guess, uh, um, protocols really require more than the eight channels. Now, I don't want to say it wouldn't be necessary, but I would say that it's 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 kind of a low likelihood that if you're trying to get started as like a hobbyist, that you'll actually need more than eight channels. And all of the devices that we're working with here support eight channels. You can buy them up to like, shoot, I, I don't even know. I know uh, I know Morgan on our team has the the, the big one. I think it's uh, six. Is it sixteen channels? Is that their their biggest, or is it the I think you know, it's 16. Yeah, 16, I think yeah. 16 the, is the big, biggest. The big boy. Um, and I, I don't know that I would like have a need. However, it would be super handy to have in case I ever did have that need. Um, but I would probably um, err on the side of saying that it's likely that eight channels would be good enough for you. Okay, yeah. No more questions yet. Ooh. So speaking of which, you are SPI and I2C. Um, how do they function? So as we saw earlier, you are an asynchronous connection. So what that actually means is that there's no clock on either side of the connection controlling the actual rate that data is being transferred. It's an agreed upon method, it's an agree agreed upon uh, number where you're supposed to actually know. So the, the bit rate and the baud rate is important for that. Um, how it determines the actual uh, connection speeds also is it uses parity bits. So there's basically uh, another layer of overhead that's being sent over the line of communication so that the negotiation and the actual transfer of data can take place. With SPI and I2C, they're actually synchronous, meaning there is a clock that's determining the communication time. So uh, for instance, SPI operates on a slave master model. So the master has is the actual determination of the clock speed. That's the one with the actual crystal that's going to determine how quickly data is going to be sent. The slave is going to basically accept that at that particular rate. Um, and that number is negotiated throughout the process. Um, I2C is a, is very, uh, functions in a very similar way. Moving on to the actual interfaces associated with these three different protocols. Uh, again, UART has two channels. Again, this is the channels column here is assuming that uh, ground's hooked up. So disregard ground right now. This is only the data lines and the information communication lines that's taking place that we're really concerned with here. Uh, that's RX and TX for UART. Uh, SPI has four channels. Uh, that's going to be MISO, MOSI, CS, and CLOCK. C chip select is enable, and CLOCK is, again, the determination of how quickly that data is going to be sent and received. Uh, MISO and MOSI are a little bit like interchangeable. It can just depend on the situation that's going on. So with SPI specifically, remember there's master slave. The master will send out data to the slave over MOSI. That stands for master out slave in. It will receive, the master will receive data from the slave over master in slave out. The master will determine the clock rate and the chip select is the enable. So the chip select is only app applicable whenever there's multiple slaves communicating with a master. Uh, and then I2C is pretty simple. It's uh, SDA and SCL. SD SCL is the communication for the, the determination of how quickly uh, data is to be sent and received. And SDA is the actual data line. So moving on from that is the, uh, uh, I guess, are, are there any questions um, maybe with regard to SPI, those two protocols? Um, with how they apply maybe to um, uh, to logic analyzers. Maybe not, because I know we just uh, kind of just yeah. answered some questions. I'm sorry, I was kind of muted. Uh, currently, <laughs> cur currently, we don't have any questions specifically on this, but I do want to encourage people that are in the, in the actual channel as attendees, please think of questions and post them into the Q&A session. Okay, you can move on, Jonathan. Cool. Yeah, I think we had to disable chat because we had had some flattering uh, uh, comments earlier. That was kind of uh, kind of awesome. The first, I think uh, Sam was mentioning it was one of the first uh, issues we had, we had run into with something exciting here. Um, but anyways, okay, so let's move on to the first exercise. Um, I don't think I see, yeah. So let's move on to the first exercise here. Um, Actually, I'm going to skip the first exercise and let's move on to the second one because we just looked at UR. Let's look at something fun. Switch it over to SPI. Also, I want to show you the uh, sexiness of this new Sailey software as well. And let's bring up the uh, the new hotness here. 
I had actually never, I didn't know that Saley had released this, uh, this new software. I think it was Morgan. So Morgan's our lab manager here at Rep7. Uh, I think it was either he or Daryl that had uh, pointed this one out, but Daryl showed me some freaking sweet new features that are uh, basically have to do with this new software. So like, just to give you the, uh, the quick rundown here, um, we still have, as, I'm sorry for shifting this screen around stuff, but remember we still have the old school, uh, not the old school, the, uh, the cheaper end logic analyzer hooked up. We're about to switch over to the Saley though. I wanna show you guys some other stuff. Um, so this is the new Saley uh, Logic 2 software. So we're now at two and you can change the amount of channels of course that are hooked up here. You can change like, you know, the different protocol analyzers associated with the connections that you're making. Um, as of course, like timing markers you can set, there's measurements you can take. And this is the dopest part is that there's like an extension. It's like, I don't know if you guys use Burp Suite that much, but this is like the extender. The extender to Burp Suite is what the extensions are to Logic 2. It's sick. You can create extensions and just basically allows you to have a lot of plugins and stuff. So um, let's go ahead and uh, swap this, this guy out. And we're going to look at a at, at, at completely different device. So this Raspberry Pi is going bye-bye. Uh, we're going to put it over there. It's a bunch of pile of other crap I got. <laughs> and then we're going to switch to the Saley logic analyzer. And then uh, also uh, we're going to look at this particular device here. So I don't know if anyone uh, on the call right now was at the uh, Rapid7 IoT Village last year. If they were, this will probably look super familiar. Um, so a couple of things. As you can see, we have markings for SPI connection. There, you see MISO, MOSI, CS, enable, clock, that kind of stuff. There's also some other stuff here. Disregard this, we're actually only gonna use ground. Um, this is for, I believe, an IC, ICSP connection, but we're not gonna be doing anything with Yatmel today. We're gonna stick directly to the, uh, to the chip, the flash chip, uh, flash memory chip that we have on here. Now, it's gonna be an open book situation, but we're also gonna pretend like we don't know the pin out of this, just to kind of make it interesting. Um, we do know it, but I'll show you guys how you can probably make that determination because it's so common that, you know, maybe you'll have like a, like a header pins that are soldered, uh, onto the actual vias, or maybe they're only vias and you have, you have to solder the header pins yourself and you have no idea what they are. And maybe for instance, you you have a WSON8. So that means WSON8, it doesn't have legs. So the flash memory chip, it's like all the solder points are on the bottom, or if it's BGA, those solder points on the bottom, so you couldn't take a multimeter to figure out what the actual pinout is, even if you found the data sheet. So kind of nifty here. Um, I'll show what that kind of stuff looks like. So uh, with that being said, let's just hook this sucker up. This is the part I was telling you guys about earlier where I'm just like, you're gonna have a good time uh, watching me do this because there's actually four cables. This is double the amount of cables as we uh, looked at earlier. And another little pro tip, uh, actually all four of these cables are not required. For doing SPI, particularly if you only have one slave connecting to master, you actually only need to connect master out slave in and clock in order to facilitate that connection. But for, just for shits and giggles, let's just connect them all. Also, I'm going to mooch off the ground interface of this uh, ICSP down here just to have something. Um, so anyways, very similar to what we saw with the other ones. Uh, the mappings of the Saley are here at the bottom. You can kind of see it's a little blurry, but my camera is not the greatest quality. Sorry guys, uh, it goes from, from zero to seven. And then uh, the channels are on the top, the ground's on the bottom. You can kind of see there how they're, how they're laid out. So we're gonna just kind of start. I'm gonna plug in ground here first. I'm gonna put it in on the far end on this side. And then we'll, uh, I'm cheating a little bit and remember you're supposed to pretend, but uh, master out slave in, I'm gonna make that, uh, that zero. So that's red. So we're gonna start red at zero and kind of work that way. If you're kind of picking up what I'm throwing down here. So red, orange, yellow, green, and we need to plug this biatch in. Um, Uh, so yeah, the um, Saley uses a um, micro USB. Uh, the, the other cheaper logic analyzers use the uh, mini mini USB, as you can see there. So we'll grab the micro USB again, hooked up to my computer. Let's plug this batch in. Um, and you, you shouldn't see a light. It's totally normal to like not see a light at first with with this guy. Um, and yeah, so let's uh, let's continue on. So let's uh, go ahead and shift the screen over to that side. 
and uh, we should now see the, uh, so one beautiful thing is, I don't know if anyone on the call has dealt with Salie before, but it's kind of a pain in the ass sometimes to, to deal with the logic analyzer and unplugging and plugging it back in because you have to like close the software and then open it again. Well, Salie too, I had the software already open. As you can see here at the top, it's now connected, the light's on. So I think it's totally dope. But uh, anyways, uh, the um, Salie software here, uh, coming, going back to the actual um, device itself, uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, it supports both uh, digital as well as as well as well analog. So as you can see here, here's the digital. So we want to put in four. We have, uh, we have a total of four channels going on right now. And we'll, we'll just go ahead and do analog and digital. We'll capture at 10 uh, mega samples per second. And um, also uh, a couple other things. So there's three different ways of capturing with this particular one. There's looping, so loop after predefined amount of time. There's the timer where it will record for a period of time and there's a trigger. Uh, so just to kind of demo some stuff, let's, let's go ahead and do a trigger. So remember zero, um, actually, let's, let's not trigger. Let's just do timer because we're, we're trying to go black box, right? So let's assume we don't know which, uh, which particular channel is which, and we're just, this is just some blind device that we found online and we don't know the data sheet and it's using something like a WSON, so we have no idea like which pin is which. Uh, so we have all the channels set up. We have the timer set up for three seconds of capture. Uh, go down here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and leave the analyzers blank and we're pretty much ready to, to start capturing here. So I'm going to grab the old, uh, the old power cable for this guy. And I have it set for three seconds, so I kind of need to be quick with my trigger finger here. Uh, gosh, damn it, go away, Zoom. <laughs> there we go, so we get full screen. All right, she's plugged in. All right, so we got it. Um, let's go ahead and zoom out here. Now, this is the capture that, that, that we just got, right? And this is during the boot up process. So what you see here is zero through three channel. This is all digital. And on the bottom, it did its best at analog. And the analog, it's, it's, not, it's not the greatest. Like it's, it's probably pretty accurate. And you can kind of see the comparison between the two. Like it tried its best at, at measuring those voltages, but it probably didn't quite do the, do the greatest that it could. But either way, there's analog. I just want to show you guys some of the analog. That's, um, it's cool to have and stuff like that, but it's not really the purpose of what I'm wanting to show you guys right now. Now, say for instance, that you don't know the mechanism of, uh, of how, or you know that it's SPI, but you don't know which pins which, right? So whenever we're looking at this device, remember I'm, uh, the, the top here is MISO, the bottom's MOSI. Channel zero is master out slave in. As I'd mentioned earlier, master out slave in is the information that's basically being transmitted from the actual chip to us. And it's probably gonna be a little bit spontaneous. There's, there's a lot of opcodes being set. There's a lot of different various settings being aligned with the actual device. And typically that's one of the first things that'll start communicating as we can see here. So we zoom in and a little bit of a telltale thing is that we're starting to see some type of communication taking place right here, a little sporadic. We also see right here, channel, channel one, Channel one in this case is clock. Remember clock is gonna actually set the cadence for how it communicates. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's a full actual uh, byte of data. That's pretty telltale. So uh, right here, of course, channel zero, we have a little bit of some type of like sporadic data being actually set. Channel one, we have kind of a constant cadence of, of uh, information being like uh, the, uh, the waveform itself. And then enable, what enable is, is say for instance, there's, there's three slaves communicating with the actual master node. The uh, enable will tell, it'll, it'll flip the bit for when that device can communicate or not. So you'll oftentimes see, and it might be a little bit of a mismatch in our timing, which we can also fix, but you'll often see with the enable that for instance, right here, there's basically like, like a one, 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 there's three ones right here. It's gonna kind of encompass that entire uh, section, if that makes sense, or cycle. Uh, so it's pretty easy to tell uh, if you just kind of if you just kind of scan it as we just did, uh, which one's MOSI, which one's clock, and then which one's gonna be enable. Again, enable in our case, channel two and three is actually not even required. So taking a little bit of a deeper dive, let's uh, take a look at the actual protocol in that analyzer. Uh, we'll click SPI here. Uh, remember we have MOSI set on zero. We have MISO set on three. 
we have clock set on one and we have enable set on two. Uh, we'll leave everything else default and we'll click save. Kind of interesting because you can actually find like, you know, more deeper information about the actual device uh, and, and the settings that's applying, that it's applying as it's booting up. Let me kind of scroll in here. Make sure I'm not losing my place. So like for instance, like right here, um, this, this is the actual uh, decoded binary uh, format. If we go here to the settings, we can change whether it's in binary, decimal, hexadecimal, ASCII, uh, and then take a look at the actual value. So in this particular case, it's like 11001010. That's the actual location where it made the determination. You can see it up here at the top as well where it's decoded. And what's kind of also interesting with this is you can take it like a step further and you can pull up the data sheet of the device. In this particular case, the model of this is the MRF49XA. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, um, I believe this one was a SOP8. I'm not, I'm not a hundred, TSOP8. I'm not hundred percent sure on that, but uh, either way, it's just an RF um, flash memory chip. So let's, let's, let's take this code that we got here. One, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. And let's just copy that. And then uh, let's go back here and let's just paste that in. So it's, a, I already had it pulled up, so I'm kind of cheating right now. So it's kind of interesting because you can take that and this is exactly what a developer would do as they're kind of producing these types of devices. They're going to like set these codes and this is going to sort of initiate the, the actual SPI flash storage of the chip. In this particular case, what we saw was 11001010. Let's paste that in again. That's right here. So we see the command code bit right there. And then we can see here below that bit seven through four are the first in, first out, fill bit counts. We have bit three. So in this particular case, uh, what you want to do is the immediate one below it is you match the next three and then map it back over to bit seven through four. In this particular, they don't always map like seven, like in a range like that. But in bit three, for instance, like uh, this guy set to zero. Bit three, that basically says synchronous character length bit. Uh, it's set to word long. So I don't want to continue going down this rabbit hole here, um, but it's something that's kind of cool to when, like when you're debugging, um, you can kind of map it back to the data sheet to actually figure out what's going on um, as far as settings being applied to the, to the chip itself. One other really cool thing I want to show everyone here real fast is we're going to make some changes here. Uh, I'm going to go back to the actual mapping of the SPI interface. Pretty sweet. I remember I mentioned earlier, we don't need MISO and we don't need enable. So let's select both of those to none. And let's do something else. This is kind of cool. This is actually a plugin that you can use um, with this. Uh, we're gonna select SDMMC from SPI. So this chip, it's not either an SD, nor is it an EMMC chip. It's just flash storage. It does, it's not a, like a solid, it's like a, not like a, uh, it's like an SD actual device, nor is it a multimedia, multimedia controller. But let's just pretend like it is for a second. You 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 select the input to go into this particular um, plugin, and then we'll click finish. And if it were an SD or if it were an EMMC, it'd be pretty sweet because up here, as you can see, where I have I'm kind of hovering over, it'll kind of just show you the actual opcodes and the actual information that it's that it's presenting. It'll kind of interpret that for you. So just kind of another sweet feature of the. Um, of the uh, logic, uh, the Sali uh, logic analyzer software. I just want to kind of show you guys that real quick. And I know we're running kind of low on time. Uh, Daryl, are, are we kind of towards the end right now? No, we got time for some questions. Uh, I have a couple questions cool. here before you move on. So um, this is kind of stepping back, but uh, do you have to worry about sample rate with cheaper analyzers? Uh, like missing data or misalignments and things like that. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. Um, I'll try to answer that with a um, with a, a little little demo of what that sample rate actually means for the um, like for instance the Sali logic analyzer, which can have very high sample rates. Um, the the quick and dirty the TLDR I'll give you is that I for the the protocols that we're kind of looking at here. For the most part, the sample rates that the cheaper these these two cheaper guys support are satisfactory for for what we're needing. I mean, it's whenever you're diving into the the really quick protocols that it really makes like a lot more of a difference. Um, because 
a lot of times with the with the really quick sample sample rates, like like say for instance, let's increase this to. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I'll be able to because. I'll be honest, this is such a analyzer can only go up to 50, but uh, like, screw it, let's let's do it anyway. Um, uh, so another question on there is uh, similar to that same topic. Is there mm -hmm. a general rule on what samples per second selection uh, that you actually make when you're setting something up? I, there's not really a general rule. It's more of a, it, it might, this is just my own experience. Now, I'm, I'm Daryl, you might have your own answer for this, but I would say I typically use it for the default, just depending on what it is. And what I use this for is typically for UART, SPI, and I2C. I would heavily be interested to hear what you have to say. Typically, uh, I, I'm pretty much the same way. Uh, what I will do uh, is if the sample rate's not high enough, uh, I've actually had uh, my sale start throwing errors and tell me that it was missing data, that it wasn't sampling quick enough. <laughs> I had that just recently mm -hmm. uh, looking on some data flow. Uh, as soon as I kick it off, man, it'd, start, it'd throw an error uh, and telling me that uh, it was a missed sample rate. Um, so uh, I was able to crank it up until it uh, the error went away. So um, ag again, sometimes I also just crank it up out of the blue uh, if I know for a fact that it's a high speed device uh, that's going to be generating a lot of fast traffic. Uh, typically, typically when you're looking at UART, SPI and stuff like that, amazingly enough, the speed uh, is often not used as even high as the chip can go. Uh, like UART, I've seen inner chip comms on a UART that could literally, uh, the chips are designed to drive at um, three, uh, uh, over uh, what over three million bits per second uh, across there, but yet uh, the developers of the device had it set up to communicate at ninety six hundred bulb. Uh, so that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I've also found that if you go too high, this particular Staley does not support it. But you also don't want to go too high because if you go too high, this what you see right here. Um, get out of the screen. It, it'll just be a giant blob. It's just a mess. It's it's capturing too much sampling and it's kind of just inaccurate at that point. So it's it's a fine line bet between the two. And another another quick point on that also is uh, typically the higher the sample rate, uh, the more memory you're going to eat up to. That's a good point. Are there any other, other questions? Uh, not at this time. Cool. And quick question. I apologize. How much more time do we have here? Just to make sure. I don't want to go too far over time. I think um, we've been at it for an hour. So I think we got uh, at least another uh, 10 or 15 minutes. For yeah, you yeah, one. definitely. You can definitely go for another 15 minutes. The next talk starts at 8 p.m. Perfect. Okay, cool. I, I uh, wasn't 100% sure on that, but um, that, that works out great because we have one more demo as well. So uh, we've talked about, we did a little kind of a... Um, a cheater exercise on Raspberry Pi. Uh, we did, I showed you guys how to sort of blindly identify SPI as well. Uh, and then next, let's let's switch back over to UART in more of a real world example. Um, so let me go ahead and unplug these guys and plug the power first on this guy here. Um, let's switch back here, make sure I don't, bust off any of these header pins live on camera because this is Daryl's device and it would suck to break it right in front of him. And <laughs> uh, let's pull over another device. That's going to be this guy. Um, so we're going to stick to the uh, the theme with the Saley. So Saley is still going to be used. Um, in this particular case, we're going to check out UART, but using the new Saley 2 software. Um, this particular device, it's a, a Z-Wave hub. I guess so to speak. So it's a uh, hub used in home automation. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty heavy in home automation here at my place, and kind of something I've always been like fascinated with. But um, this particular device, it's a Z-Wave hub, and uh, let's dig right in. So right off the off the bat, um, something that can easily be kind of noticed, I guess, is that uh, on this device there was these these like three three header pins. Um, I soldered the headers on, but Previously, it was just like three holes just kind of sitting there. And, you know, that's kind of like telltale that, you know, maybe, maybe it might be kind of interesting to kind of poke at, you know. 
Um, it can, it can be anything. It can be I2C. Maybe there's an EEPROM chip on here that's, you know, disclosed, or it could be anywhere. It could also like not be on here. And when I mentioned WSON earlier, uh, actually I can't quite tell if this is WSON or actually a BGA, but either way, uh, same difference. Sometimes you can't actually see the legs of the device to where you map it out. So like, say for instance, these headers, but rather like sometimes you can, which is what you see right here. This is a, this is a traditional TSOP 8. So TSOP 8's got the legs, WSON does not. And I, I'm pretty sure it's WSON. It, it might be BGA, but I'm pretty confident that it's WSON. This one for sure is a, a BGA microcontroller, but either way, uh, sometimes you can't like take like a multimeter to check that that this pin right here connects to that pin right there. So therefore, sometimes a logic analyzer will come into play, and then that's where it's usually beneficial to to do this type of stuff. So let's just move on. Let's uh, plug this sucker in and see what we get. So we only need a couple of connections here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow the cables that I was using earlier for the UART. So uh, in this particular case, there's only three connections being made. Um, one thing you can do with this is uh, basically take a multimeter to figure out which one's ground. In that case, let's just assume that I did that because I know which one's ground, but like it's pretty easy to tell which one's ground with, with, just, a, with just a multimeter. So, and the ground is actually gonna be the pin on the far right in this particular case. So let's hook up black to ground and let's just hook up, you know, white and like the silver one to the other two, not knowing which one's which. So uh, again, using the, the handy dandy mappings that we have on the Sally, we plug that sucker right in to ground. And then we plug in the other two to channels, just plug them to zero and one, just make it kind of easy. And next, let's, uh, you know what, let's do a trigger. Uh, we're kind of gambling right now. Uh, we're supposed to be in Vegas right now, so. Fuck it, let's do some type of gambling, right? Uh, we don't know which ones which ones transmit, but what we're betting on right now is that channel zeros transmit. We have no idea. So let's just figure out that's what it was. And what we're triggering on is a rising edge. And what that says is that whenever you see a rising edge in the transmission in that waveform, that's when you start capturing. So in memory, it's capturing the whole time, but the actual capture that, that comes back and returns to you is the actual... Uh, um, the trigger that you set here. You can trigger rising edge, falling edge, high pulse or low pulse. Um, in this particular case, let's just say, as soon as you see some type of traffic going on on channel one, that's when you want it. That's when we want you to capture. And we only need to capture for three seconds, delete everything else afterwards. And we only need two channels here. So let's get rid of those other two. We're gonna leave it at 50 uh, mega samples per second. And that is that we're not gonna capture on analog. So let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, Actually, let's let's uh, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna close out of that. We're gonna click start, and it's literally waiting for the trigger. So you see down there in the bottom right hand corner, waiting for trigger. Let's plug this bastard in. Holy shit, we're we're correct. Um, yeah. So we well we still have the, the stupid mosi. Let me delete these uh, logic um the decoders. Uh, this is my bad. Uh, I can get rid of that. Uh, and yeah, if we're in Vegas, we basically, uh, we bet like a hundred bucks on red and it landed on red because it's exactly what happened here. So go us, right? Uh, channel zero is TX, just as we were hoping for. So that trigger was met and it recorded for three seconds. So scrolling into here, we can see some of the data, of course, you know, this is like the zero one, zero one. Um, and this is a part, as I showed you earlier with the OG um, logic analyzer, or uh, sorry, the OG uh, logic software. Uh, we'll put input channel, we'll set the set to zero, 11.5200. We, uh, we don't know what the baud rate is for this guy. I believe it actually is 11.5200. Um, remember, we talked about how to check that. Um, but of course, here we go. Um, we're seeing all the data as well as part of the boot up. So boot, SPL, 2017. Uh, and just various other information that it's uh, printing out to standard out as it's 
performing boot sequence. Uh, so anyways, just wanted to show you guys another example of that um, on the new software here. Um, it's pretty slick. It's totally awesome. I, I like it a lot. Um, you know, it's super useful. You can see like the parity bits. This is basically the, uh, the little white dots is uh, kind of managing the communication timing whenever it's sending data back and forth. In this case, it's transmitting. So um, anyways, that being said, that's kind of the end of the demo here. I just want to give another example of uh, what uh, it means to communicate or what it looks like to communicate using the new Staley 2 software. Questions? Yeah, let's go ahead. I think we have some questions. Uh, let me look at this first. If the Salay software works for any analyzer, uh, what would be the consideration in purchasing uh, the more expensive offer over a cheaper hardware option shown? So why would I, why, one, why would I want to buy a, uh, a, a expensive $600 logic analyzer when I can buy a $24 logic analyzer um, since I could use the software? Yeah, and that makes sense. So uh, as we talked about, the speeds are, I don't want to say they're negligible, but you do get significantly higher um, uh, recording speeds with the, uh, with the Saley than you would do with the, uh, these, these cheaper versions as well. Um, another thing too is that uh, the actual accuracy of the protocol dec decoding I've noticed is, is higher with the Saley than it is with the, either of these other two devices. Um, that being said, you know, it, it really just depends on, on what your, your needs are. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's pretty good quality. Like, for instance, uh, I've had a couple of times where I was doing some type of logic. I was doing basically decoding and actually a live capture. And both, uh, I, had a, I had a crash with the software with both of these devices. So you'll notice that it's a little bit sluggish. It's a little bit rough around the edges. It's a, again, you kind of get what you pay for. Um, the communication again. There's been kind of like lags and hiccups um, with these two. They they get the job done, but I've noticed that the accuracy for how close um, of how it captures is a little bit more specific with the Saley. So if what you're looking to do is going to you know require you to know those voltages at more of an accurate level, then maybe consider the Saley versus these guys. I mean, if you're just doing some general like debugging things like that, I think these are not a bad choice. Um, that's just my opinion. Daryl, do you have, any, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think accuracy is probably one of the bigger things and the ability to process at a higher uh, a higher speed, um, I think, are, are the value. And that's why I went with a higher value product because uh, I often, I personally often encounter things that those would not work on at all uh, just from the fact that it's higher speed. Uh, I often get into more, uh, inner chip, uh, inner chip communication analysis, which is often at a much higher speed than external communication. That makes sense. Uh, the other question here is a good question. Do you need special hardware for JTAG? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, if you look here, um, the capability exists for, um, adding JTAG actually does it. I, I don't know if it does on this, on this logic too or not. Um, I'm I think still, it does. Kinda... I'm not sure. Yeah, it uh, does. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sure does. Um, now the, the, qu the question was, is there a specific hardware needed for JTAG? In this case, if you're trying to like identify, you know, what is TMS, what's TCK, if you're trying to identify with JTAG, what are those debug interfaces? It, you you might have the capability of doing it with a logic analyzer. Now, at that point, you're kind of, I, I, I don't want to say you're putting a, a round peg in a square hole, but I don't know if you're necessarily using the right tool. Um, it has a capability of doing it like this, but you might consider using other pieces of hardware um, for doing something like JTAG. Now, like for JTAG, say for instance, you don't know what the pinouts are and you're trying to identify that. That's where you would use something like, for me personally, I would go after a, a multimeter first and I would try to ring it out with the MCU. So I try to find the data sheet and use that data sheet to identify where on the MCU based off those pins of the MCU, where does that fall out and use that to identify the pinouts of the JTAG. If you don't have the data sheet or maybe you don't know where the MCU is or maybe it's a BGA MCU, 
then you'd maybe use some type of boundary scanner. A great example of that's a JTAGulator. Um, another thing that you could kind of use the Sali for is a boundary scanner, sort of. In that particular instance, it could help you, yes. Um, now, if you're wanting to do something like program an MCU or uh, program the device or upload the device to a flash memory to program an MCU, then you would need some type of programmer and that's going to be vendor specific. So say for instance, it's a STM32, you could use something like, like a, um, a ST-Link device. Um, J-Link supports open OCD in a lot of cases, so it can support multi-manufacturers. If it's like an Atmel, you want to use like a Picket. So if you're wanting to like either dump or flash some firmware onto an MCU or flash memory, you would use whatever programmer is assigned to that particular um, chip set. Um, outside that, um, you can use a logic analyzer for doing some ex like limited boundary scanning, but that's kind of not really why it's designed, but it, the capability exists. Yep, and uh, on conclusion, there was, uh, there was one comment, there are a couple comments in here I thought were funny. Uh, one was, uh, it would be funny if someone designed a board with a honeypot header that had 50 volts on it. Uh, <laughs> that's so Jonathan would hook up his three hundred dollar uh logic analyzer and watch it burst into flames uh, dear god yeah that would, that would fry <laughs> the man bun right off my head <laughs> <laughs> so i thought that i thought that was a funny comment uh uh which is which is definitely the level of evil i would expect from uh, defcon so thank you for that uh, and then a couple comments uh saying you did a good job so uh that was pretty good so uh, are there any more questions from anyone uh, as we're getting ready to conclude? Wait, I think there's one more. Uh, one was asking more like model numbers on those cheaper ones. Do you have that information? I think those are so generic in nature. Um, you know what I'm talking about, the two cheap logic analyzers. Is there any kind yeah. of information on there for acquisition? I think you had a page that actually showed the uh, – um, the link to the uh, or information to the actual Amazon. Uh, site. Uh, yeah, uh, let me see here. I'll actually just real quickly uh, do one even better um, for like whoever asked the, the question about that, like Amazon.com. If you like just search like logic analyzer. Um, I mean, one of the ones we're using is like. I think it was the first one in the list showed up there yeah. at the top. Yeah, yeah, that's like, one of them. If you go up to the top, I think the first one in the list was one of them we purchased right there. That's one of them. That's the uh, high let high let go USB one. So, um, I actually have the other one too. It's kind of funny because it came with the uh, the Adify um, Adify toolkit or whatever. It's got like a red face to it. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you may uh, have it, called any number of different names. Uh, oh, it's it's Spark Fun. Yeah, SparkFun. Yeah, SparkFun relabels that um, that Chinese one. Yeah, it's this one. So I mean, just go online. Really, it's kind of the like here's here's one of them, and here's the other, and it's just you can just Google or not Google Amazon search those two. I'm pretty sure this is exactly both of them. Yep. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Let's see. Uh, any more questions? Are hand tech any good? Um, have you messed with a hand tech before? Oof, I'm not too sure. Uh, hand, hand tech so logic. Yeah. Hand tech, yeah. H oh, oscilloscope or the logic analyzer? Probably a logic analyzer since this is a logic analyzer. I have I not. About... Well, you were there a minute ago before you checked on the... Uh... Oscope. There was one showing up there as a logic analyzer. I could have oh, sworn. Uh, end in E K, T E K. We were quickly running out of time here, but. Uh... Oh, I've seen pictures of these guys. Uh, it looks. I mean, it's got two gigs of DDR2 memory. I mean, that's hella better than I think what any of the Salies have. So. I, I, in my the quick and dirty real real quick with that one that's a very high sample rate and that's a lot of memory so the higher the memory the higher the sample rate the longer you can capture and the more pinpoint accuracy you can get in those captures that's probably i guess my two cents on, on that particular one and it looks cool it looks dope as hell <laughs> cool yeah i have a mess with one so
Okay, I think that pretty much uh, concludes it. Hopefully, uh, the people that wanted to ask questions were able to ask questions. Um, feel free to reach out to uh, any one of us. Uh, Jonathan, um, you can reach out to him um, anytime. He's available. I think he's on Twitter. Um, do you get your Twitter ID out there, man? Uh, yeah, Twitter ID, Frankensteiner. There you go. Good luck remembering that. So if you ever want to ask him any questions or uh, harass him, there you go. <laughs> or, yeah, if you want to figure out what my address is, I'll honestly just give it to you if you're really that curious. You don't have to do whatever, Google it or whatever, like the person did at the beginning. <laughs> well, hey, thank you so much. I think there might be a few extra questions. So if either of you have time to jump into the IOTV talk questions text Discord channel, um, there's there's definitely people that were pretty engaged with this talk, despite the technical difficulties. This was our first and only live presentation that had any issues. So I mean, what are the chances of that? It's like getting your it's like getting a you know a bird pooping on your head. Maybe it's good luck. Nice. <laughs> it is it is good luck. <laughs>